Good morning, church. Whoa. Guess you can hear me, huh? <laughs> My name is Kathy Mackey, and I will be your liturgist this morning. I want to welcome all of you. We're uh, so delighted to see you here this morning at Community United Methodist Church. And I would like to ask you to pray with me this morning. One of my favorite prayers, be at peace. Please pray with me. Do not look forward in fear to the changes in life. Rather, look to them with full hope as they arise. God, whose very own you are, will deliver you from out of fearful times. God has kept you until now, and he will lead you safely through all things. And when you cannot stand, God will carry you in his arms. Do not fear what may happen tomorrow. The same everlasting Father who cares for you today will take care of you then and every day. He will either shield you from suffering or will give you unfailing strength to bear it. Be at peace and put aside all anxious thoughts and imaginations. Amen. I have just a few announcements. Uh, you have announcements in your bulletin. <clears throat> Excuse me. But there's a couple of changes I'd like to point out. One, um, there will be a nurture committee meeting on Tuesday the 18th at 2 o'clock. There will be no missions meeting on that day. And on Thursday, May 27th, there will be an administrative council meeting. I'm not sure of the time for that. Seven. <laughs> I'm reading sign language. Um, immediately following today's service, we will have a special charge conference sending for Dan Sherrill. So be sure and stay for that. And um, now would you please stand for our call to worship? which is on page 755. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Pardon me. I'll read for the screen, thank you. <laughs> the Lord will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble, will conceal me under the cover of his tent, and will set me high upon a rock. Hear, O oh Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. Come, my heart said, seek the Lord's face. Your face, O oh Lord, I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger, for you have been my help. Cast me not off, forsake me not, O oh God of my salvation. If my Please remain standing. Our opening song today is On Eagle's Wings. The words are on the screen. <laughs>
good, y'all. Be seated, please. Amen. Well, good morning, church. Good morning. We are so glad that you're welcoming here with us, either in person or still at home online. We are glad that you joined us. I'm in hope that you're able to experience the goodness and fullness of God's grace as you worship with us today. Um, I have a few things that I just want to talk to you about. We're having a, a few staff changes. One is if you haven't met Aaron and Emily Beltran and their son Theo, Aaron is over here. Say hi, Aaron. Aaron started on Wednesday of last week. He is our new associate in charge of youth and outreach ministries. And so if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask him or Emily. We're so excited to have them on staff. But I also found out this week that my secretary will be resigning in about a month, a month and a half. But I think we may have game plans to replace her in the works. Uh, where'd my SPRC chair go? He knows something about it. Oh, there he is way back in the back. Hey, Murray. Um, he is here. I'm glad you're not skipping today. So <laughs> that's, I was like, where's our nurture committee chair at? It's Betty Leonard. She's the first certified lay minister. And I was like, oh, right. She's filling in for Dan at high rolls today. <laughs> um, and then after the service, um, Dan Cheryl has been called to full-time ordained ministry in the Methodist system. And he will be starting... In about 20 minutes when he gives his first sermon here today. So, just kidding. Or am I, Dan? Um, so we have a lot of good that is going on. Um, and so I'm going to just pray to start off with for the overall direction and guidance of our congregation as God continues to lead and guide us. And then after that, if there is a specific concern or request that you would like to voice... If you would just lift that up, and we as God's people will reply, Lord, hear our prayer. And then at the end of the prayer, we will all say the Lord's Prayer together. So let's take a few moments, um, about 15, 20 seconds of silence to silent our hearts and minds and your cell phones if they're not yet silenced, so that we can go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for all that you are doing in our midst, in our life, in our congregation, and even in our society and state, as it looks like we're finally seeing the light on the horizon with COVID. So we just want to thank you and praise you for that. We want to thank you and praise you for bringing Emily and Aaron and Theo to us this morning. Um, and just to continue to lead and guide our youth program, I pray blessings upon them, um, guidance for them and for our students as they just make relationships here inside the walls of this congregation and outside the walls, drawing people into relationship with you. And Father, I just ask that um, you provide the right person and the right timing for your secretary. Um, and I just praise and rejoice for what you have done and um, with our imagination station, our preschool, and that you have guided us to a new director who will start in June. Father, we thank you and praise you for your wonderful mercies that you are pouring out upon us here. But Father, in the midst of all that is good, we know that without you, it is all for naught. And so, God, we need the guidance and the power of your Holy Spirit continually to lead us and guide us into your paths. That you would help us to stay faithful to you and you alone in spite of what the world is calling us to allow us to seek your face, to hear your voice, and to be prompted by your spirit in all times and in all places. And I thank you so much for the fidelity of my brothers and sisters that surround me today for your calling in their lives and how they are faithfully responding. So lead and guide us, O oh God, your church. And Father, we ask that you be with the people and places and situations that we know and love that need your touch this morning. So Father, we lift them to you right now. Lord, hear our prayers. 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 
Lord, hear our prayers. Lord, hear our prayers. Lord, hear our prayers. Lord, hear our prayers. Lord, hear our prayers. More rain. Lord, hear our prayers. Lord, hear our prayers. Lord, hear our prayers. Lord, hear our prayers. Father, it's Lord, hear our prayers. And so it's this and all things, Father, Son, and Spirit, that we lift up to you and join us together as we join in praying the prayer that you taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Join me now as we sing number 568 in your hymnal, Christ for the World We Sing. And let's all stand and sing. on the screen. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. 
We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In part three of our Charles Wesley hymn series, the choir will be singing, Oh, for a heart to praise my God. It was introduced in the book, Hymns and Sacred Poems in 1742. The scriptural basis was Psalms 51:10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Wesley scholar James I. Warren Jr. describes this hymn as seeking perfection in love. In the first stanza, the sinner yearns for their heart to be cleansed. Throughout the successive stanzas, the believer then pleads to God to keep their heart pure, growing to be more like Christ. If you want, you can follow along on the words on page 417 in your hymnal.
So if our children want to be dismissed for Children's Church... left, I just want to make a quick request. Uh, we have, I think, three different adults that are working with our children in Children's Church. And how many of y'all used to be a kid? <laughs> oh, it's a trick question, isn't it? <laughs> so if anybody else would like to help with our children in Children's Church, we would love to have your support in that. Just talk to me or Tanya Barlow. She's heading it up. Thank you for that. And now you can stand for the scripture reading. <laughs> Today's reading is from Matthew 7, verses 15 to 20. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorns or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will know them by their fruits. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Amen. And you may be seated. And if you would, once again, join me in prayer. Father, I ask that you send your spirit upon us, that you would soften our hearts and open our ears to your words. And I ask that you allow the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart to be pleasing and acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. Last year for Father's Day and my birthday, my wife and kids got me um, a couple of cherry trees, because I really like things that produce fruit. Like, I've always been a farmer, still own a bit of a farm in West Texas, and I like for things to be able to see what happens. And you know what happened after we planted those cherry trees in the fall? We got cherries. A deer didn't eat them because we put them inside the fence with our dog that's 85 pounds, and so he keeps the deer away. But, like, it's shocking to expect that you plant a cherry tree and you get cherries, right? Like, who would have thought that happens? Oh, wait, yeah, most people, hence the name cherry tree. I wouldn't get apricots or even watermelon or something else, but I got cherries. And at this rate, um, we paid about $50 a cherry. So, <laughs> yeah. This year we're hoping to knock it down to 5 or $6 a cherry, but... Maybe one day we'll make our money back. <laughs> Jesus teaching here about fruit, I don't think he's saying that we literally need to become trees, right? So when you go home, don't take your shoes off and dig a hole and plant yourself in the ground and expect fruit to grow. But he is saying you, the life of the believers, you're going to produce fruit. And you can produce good fruit, or you can produce bad fruit. And if we produce bad fruit, that is not good. But if we produce good fruit, that will be rewarded and multiplied and things will happen because of it. And worst of all, like there, is, there are never two options. Um, my son loves to tell my daughter, um, okay, Emily, do you want to choose this or that? And we've worked really hard at telling Emily that you can say, I don't want either of those options. <laughs> And Jesus says the same thing. is like, you can produce fruit or no fruit, um, but the reality is if you, or you can produce good fruit or bad fruit, but if you produce no fruit, which is also an option, um, that reality is not a pleasant one. He says that you'll be cut off and tossed into the fire, and none of us like that option, right? So we produce good fruit or bad fruit. We can have thorns 
our fruit. And this fruit, if you've heard me talk before, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, Galatians 5.22, or you can read part of my dissertation later if you want to about it. <laughs> um, it's what God produces in us, how God is working in our lives. But these thorns, oftentimes when the church looks at the, or when the world looks at the church, they don't see our fruitfulness they see our thorniness. I mean, think about the news articles that we see about the church. Never was a faithful pastor enjoys wife and children. Church grows. Like blasted across CNN. No. But it's sex scandal. Clergy are pedophiles. Don't trust religious leaders. Churches are fighting and breaking apart again. Right? Those are typically the headlines that the world sees. They see our thorns and not our fruit. So what does it mean for us to bear fruit? I've been asking the question over the last couple of weeks, that's why we're focusing on Charles Wesley Hymns, is what does it mean for us to be a Methodist? It means for us to love God, for us to love people, and we realize we can do neither of those things without the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, Wesley continues in his works... Um, we have an extra copy in the library if you'd like to read one of the 14 volumes. <laughs> Wesley says, a Methodist is a tree that is known by its fruits. For as long as he or she loves God and keeps the, God's commands, not only some of God's commands or most of them, but all of them from the least to the greatest. This is what it means for us to be Methodist. It means for us to be known by our fruits, to bear fruit. And it's striking that we're seeing this in Wesley because somebody earlier this morning said that, again, it was Jesus, right? And remember, like, my boss is here, so I may get in a little trouble for saying this, but as Jesus is up here and Methodist is somewhere below, <laughs> Depends on where you're at as where you want to go, but we always follow Jesus first and foremost, but it's striking how similar Wesley is in describing what it means for us to be Methodist, and what Jesus is describing is what it means for us to be followers of Christ. And both of them say that we are called to bear fruit, to be known by our fruit. And Jesus takes it a little bit further when we read in the Gospel of John, he says not only should we be known by our fruit, but listen to what he says in John 15. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit, and every branch that bears fruit he prunes to make it bear more fruit. We, his church, must bear fruit for Christ. Now, I don't know a whole lot about vineyards. Ashley's uncle and cousin own a vineyard, and so I helped put a few of the vines in the ground. I helped water a couple of them. I've even helped harvest one season, and it's great fun. But you know what they never allow me to do? Prune the vines, because I have no clue what it means for them to prune vines, because what Garrett's told me, our cousin, is that there are certain vines that are on a grapevine that their only purpose is to make the vine bigger. They have absolutely nothing to do with fruit production. And the more of those vines that grow, the smaller your grapes get and the sourer they become. And unless you cut that vine off that wants to grow to make it bigger, then your fruit's going to be small and worthless. And I can tell you, the reason they grow vines is to make good wine, and it needs lots of sugar. And then... He says, later in the season, you come back and you prune the vines a second time. And I have no clue which ones he knows how to prune. But he says he prunes certain ones. And what will happen is the next season after that vine is pruned, what he pruned will produce buds underneath it so that they'll grow new fruit the next year. What Jesus is saying is, look, there are some parts of Christianity, some parts of the church that look beautiful and flowery but they produce no fruit, and they're worthless. 
And there are other parts that are growing that look fruitful, that are good. And even those parts that are good, unless we keep them pruned, they won't produce fruit in the future. And so like it or not, church, what Jesus is saying is that there are areas in our church, areas in our life that we need to have pruned. And everybody likes to have something pruned, right? (laughs) Yeah. He is saying that we must be pruned. We see this in both verses. We see that if it's not having any fruit at all, what does Jesus do in Jerusalem in the last seven days of his life? He sees a fig tree that has no fruit. He curses it. It withers and dies. We don't want to be that. We would much rather be pruned. And Jesus continues in John 15, 4. He says this. He says, abide in me as I abide in you. For just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. For I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit. Because apart from me, you can do nothing. Eugene Peterson says it like this in the message. He says that we're called to stay in God's house. We're called to stay connected to God. Staying with that great vineyard image, as soon as the vine gets disconnected, as soon as a branch is disconnected from the vine, what happens to it? It dies. Yeah. As soon as we disconnect ourselves from God and our relationship with Him, We wither and we die, church. That is not where God is calling us to be. That's why Wesley tells us things that are means of grace, or other pastors call them spiritual disciplines, ways that we stay connected with God. You read your Bibles, you pray, you do Christian conferencing by coming to church or being in small accountability groups. You fast, you surrender your lives, you give up things to him. These things help draw us deeper into relationship with God so that we can abide in him. Because he says, unless you abide in me, what can we do? Nothing. We can do nothing apart from God. So we must abide in him so that we can bear fruit. And Paul takes it just a little bit further. He adds just a little bit to this conversation. So just bear with me as I walk a little bit more through the Bible. In Galatians chapter 6, Paul says this. He says, don't be deceived. God isn't to be mocked. For you reap what you sow. If you sow your own flesh, you're going to reap corruption from the flesh. But if you sow to the Spirit, you'll reap eternal life from the Spirit. So don't grow weary in doing what is right, for we will reap at harvest time if we don't give up. So then, whatever we do, we have an opportunity. Let us then work for the good of all, and especially those in the family of the faith. The crazy thing about fruit is that when you sow, I sowed radishes and cucumbers in my little garden yesterday. What do I hope starts growing in six to ten days? Radishes and cucumbers. What would happen if all of a sudden I got strawberries and watermelon? Like, I mean, I'd still be happy because who doesn't like strawberries and watermelon? But they're not radishes and cucumbers. They're not what I sow. And what Paul is saying is that we, as followers of Christ, we begin to reap what we sow. What happens all too often, though, is in the churches, we look at society around us, and let's be real, it's not what it used to be. I've never lived in the glory days of the church. I've never seen it just bustling and thriving. I've only seen the reality that now 46% of Americans associate themselves with a church that's less than half, percent, less than half of the population. For the first time since Gallup started recording in the 1930s, it's the first time it's ever happened. And instead of looking at the world and being like it's going to hell in a handbasket and saying, well, let's just form our little holy huddle and circle up and protect our crops, what Paul is saying is we get to reap what we sow. And so if we're out here just sowing protection and sowing discontent with the world, then the world's going to see a bunch of people that are kind of grumpy and discontent with themselves. And when was the last time you showed up to somebody's house and they weren't happy to see you? 
And how long did you stay? <laughs> it probably wasn't very long. Or when you went to somebody's house and they were just like, you know what's wrong with you? Let me tell you, you're not living the life that I want you to live. And I know that's easy for me to say because my kids are 12 and 10 right now, so it's easy for me not to deal with them when they're adults. But man, this is what's happened in the world as we started reaping what we've been sowing because what we're sowing is, world, you're not good enough for us. You're not holy enough. You're not righteous enough. You don't look like us or sound like us. And the world is saying, no, that's not what I want. The world wants to know they're loved. The world wants to know joy and peace and happiness and forgiveness. And you know the whole way the early church grew? It was because they had a dynamic evangelism program with amazing staff and a good 10-year plan. <laughs> yeah. Peter was writing on his whiteboard. Step one, fight with Paul. That, no, that's not how they grew. They grew because the Roman society was so depraved around them that when people looked at the early church, they saw people that were filled with life and love and forgiveness and peace. And the people around them were like, what in the world is going on with that person? Why are they rejoicing while they're being tortured? How can we get some of that? And Paul is saying in the midst of his sufferings, in the midst of his imprisonments, that when we sow the fruit of the Spirit in this world, that then the church will be able to reap it. James actually tells us what we need to reap and what we need to sow. In James chapter 3, verse 18, he says, A harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. If we want to harvest righteousness, if we want to harvest the kingdom of God, then our job as followers of Christ is to sow the fruit of the Spirit into the church and into the world. That means our lives bear love and joy and peace, self-control, we all like that one, and patience. This is what we look like. This is what we bear into the world and so question for the day, I think, for you is, church, what fruit are you bearing? If somebody looked into your life and had a few words to describe you, would they say that you look like love and joy and peace? Or would they say you look angry and bitter and discontent? And not just as an individual, but when they look at our church, what do they see? Talking to Aaron this week, one of the reasons he became a follower of Christ in college, because he met Christians who lived it out, and not Christians that just went out and partied after. So please don't go to the bars and get drunk after this. <laughs> but are we burying that fruit in our world? Or do we as a church just look like a Christian business to glorify ourselves? My hope and my prayer for this church for quite a while actually is that we would be a church that bears fruit. Um, many of you know that when before even this building started the construction process, many of us prayed over the empty lot and prayed that God's spirit would move. One of the things that I don't think you know is that as the building was being built, I would come in here by myself and pray over the building. And when the stage got here, um, I started praying on the spot that I would be preaching from. And one of those days that I was praying um, just to God, I felt like the Holy Spirit to tell me that I needed to start praying that our church would bear fruit, that we would be fruitful in the world. And what that looked like is sending men and women and children from this congregation into the world to serve him. Because that's what fruit does, right, is reproduces. The whole reason an apple tree produces apples is so that the seeds inside it can hit the ground and grow more apple trees. One of the whole reasons that we are a church is so that we can go into the world and reproduce the fruit of the kingdom of God. 
And so as I was praying, I prayed that God would send men and women and children from this congregation to serve in the, all the corners of the world. And little did I know that when I was praying that, that the very chair of our building committee, Dan Cheryl, was feeling called to ministry. Little did I know that Ernie would call him up and say, hey, I want you to go serve in high rolls. And when Dan started serving in high rolls after apparently something that happened here on Christmas Eve in his heart, he felt the conviction to begin a full-time ministry. That's bearing fruit. And my hope in prayer church is that Dan is not the first or the only person from this congregation that feels called to ministry, either pastoral or missions or even ministry and walking across the street to show your neighbor that they are loved. Because God, church, God calls us to bear his fruit and not to be a bunch of fruitcakes. There's a difference. So you need to remember that each and every one of you has been called out by God. That's literally what the word for church in Greek means is called out. We are called out from God to create this beautiful, melodious sonnet, lifting our voices and praises to God, each living our individual calling so that God's name is glorified. We're not called to create a cacophony of noise, just sound, clanging gongs and cymbals, but to create this harmonious music for the God because you are a royal priesthood. You are a royal nation. You are God's own possession, chosen by him, called by him, and he is longing for each and every one of you to bear his fruit. The thing about my cherry trees, and I didn't realize this at the time when Cindy sold them to me, Cindy Adams in our church, is that um, we plan on buying one cherry tree. That doesn't work. You have to have different varieties of cherry trees because they need to pollinate each other. So if I would have just bought one Bing cherry tree, this year I would have had zero cherries. So instead I bought one Bing cherry tree and one Van cherry tree so that they can start to pollinate. And church, I can tell you, not everybody in this room, praise be to God, is called to be an ordained elder in the United Methodist Church. You can say a relief. <laughs> It takes different callings and different graces for the church to grow and mature. Paul says it takes apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers for the growing and the maturing of the church. It takes different varieties of Christians, different giftings for us to utilize what God has given us so that we can grow into the church that God is calling. And I can promise you right now, some of you, God is calling to serve him and to go deeper in your relationship with him than you've ever gone before. The other interesting thing about my cherry trees is um, they didn't just magically bow down and rub their flowers against each other, right? Like, I would have loved to see that happen. <laughs> but instead, you know how new cherries happen is because we had some bees or some insects or some people with Q-tips that were very precise and patient <laughs> because we didn't see bees or insects to cross-pollinate. It took something completely outside of the cherry trees themselves to make it happen. And so it is with us, church. We can have everything in the right place in the right time, but without the promise and the power of the Holy Spirit, the pollination's not going to occur. And so we, if we long to bear fruit, need to continually pray that the Spirit of God will work in our lives and in our midst so that we can be the church that God is calling us to be. But sadly, we live in a world that lives off of fast foods that are processed and artificial. And we've lived in a society that has created churches that produce the same sort of fake fruit. With quick answers and cheap discipleship. This is not the church that God is calling us to be. This is not who we should be as individuals, but we should be people who are faithfully obeying and abiding in Christ at all days and all times so that we can remain in him, so that we can bear his fruit. So church, 
Let us be a church that continues to bear fruit for the goodness of God in our lives and in our community so that his name is glorified, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, and his church is grown. This is what it means for us to follow Christ, and this is what it means for us to be Methodist. Let us pray. Father, we do thank you for the areas in our lives that bear good fruit. The areas in which we can keep your commands, as Wesley urges us to do. The areas in which we abide in you. But God, each of us know that there are areas in our life that don't have good fruit, that are producing no fruit, that need to be pruned and trimmed back. Reveal those to us right here, right now. And Father, for the areas that produce fruit, I pray that you allow us to sow a crop of righteousness through the gifts of the Spirit, the love and joy and peace that you have for us so that this world can see your goodness and glory at all times and in all places. I pray that you would continue to raise up men and women and children from this place to serve you across the corners of the world, whether it's across the street, down in Santa Elena, or even in Cloudcroft. God, that you would raise up your children to serve you faithfully and fully, and that we, your church, would bear your fruit for your glory. So come, Holy Spirit, come, and help us to produce a fruit that is beyond measure and a kingdom that has no end. We ask these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And know that as we prepare to sing this final song, if God is stirring in your life and in your heart, the altars are always open. If you want to know more about what it means to give your life to live for Christ, please come and talk to me. Or more about what it means to be um, a member of our congregation. Or maybe, just maybe, God is calling somebody besides Dan Cheryl to ministry. Maybe it's you. If you want to respond to that call, please come and talk to me in the back as we sing, stand and sing this final song. Our closing hymn is sent forth by God's blessing.
So if you would, um, I have some amazing things. You know, God always does amazing things in our midst. Amen, church? Amen. What? Amen, Amen church? Amen. And so one of the great things that God is doing in our midst is we have um, Roy and Joe Webb that would like to join our congregation today. And so I'm going to ask them a couple of questions. One is, do you have faith in Jesus Christ? And two, will you support this church with your prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness? And church, I want to ask you, will you accept Roy and Joe into our membership and disciple them? Yes. And so I'd like to welcome our newest members. So you can clap. And as a people of praise, rejoicing in all that God has given us, know that if you continue to want to continue to support our congregation financially, we have boxes in the back. And if there's anything the church can ever do for you, please let us know. But let us join in the doxology before we sing the bene or say the benediction. Praise God. And so receive this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May he be merciful to you. And may his goodness and countenance be upon you each and every one of your days. And as you leave this place, may his grace and his mercy and his peace overflow into your hearts and your lives and into the society around us. So go, church, and be the church. Amen? Amen. Amen.